You know, it's hard for people to realize, and I'm not supposed to say this, and I wasn't supposed to say it then, but, you know, it's a film for 12-year-olds. Hello tonight. Just me. Mm. Have you been with us before? First time. Oh, you picked a great night. You're about to enter the real world. You're 12 years old. We played too hard with him, and you didn't understand him. He tried to grab you, and, and he fell, and he hit his head. We're going together. I'll tell them what happened. It's a film for 12 year olds. 12 year olds. 12 year olds. 12 year olds. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. Hello there. The highest levels are involved in the conspiracy. Nancy Pelosi is Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. 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 I love democracy. Democracy. All who gain power. Fear, fear, fear. We'll keep the local systems in line, line. The truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view, point of view. Welcome to the Conspiracy in the Force podcast. Star Wars, conspiracies, and more. With your host, me, Conspiracy Kyle. Kyle. Rebellions are built on hope, hope. For God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, darkness, darkness. As long as there's light, light. This is what Luke says before he goes to the toilet. This is Red 5. I'm going in. Good morning. Sunday morning. Hey, Conspiracy Kyle here. Welcome to another episode of Conspiracy in the Force, Star Wars, Conspiracies, and more. And more. And more. And more. On this episode, I'll be breaking down the key elements of the first three episodes of the Andor series that just dropped on Wednesday, September 21st, 2022. Now, if you missed my preview for this show from last week, go back and listen to that one. This episode will have three distinct sections. The first section will focus on the overall vibe of the story. The second will jump into specific elements. And then in the third and final section, we'll go through a very interesting biblical parallel that was brought to my attention recently. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. Now, right off the bat, I would say that this show is probably the most thematically mature than most recent Star Wars content that's been launched so far. It's definitely a departure from the more fun nature of the Mandalorian or Obi-Wan series. I mean, in the first few minutes, you see a character getting shot in the head while essentially begging for his life. You also see some implied sex scenes as well, one between two characters in a bedroom, and another one where there's an Amsterdam red light district type vibe And there's even a straightforward brothel. 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 So this has been a cause of debate amongst Star Wars fans. Does this type of content belong in the lexicon of Star Wars? Is it too much? As mentioned in the intro to the show, George Lucas always intended for Star Wars to be for kids. And I would argue that this series may be the first one that doesn't fit that description. Now, let's think about this from a conspiracy angle. Is there possibly something intentional about this type of content? and where it's being placed in the content release schedule? Is this show meant to be a bait and switch to kids who haven't been exposed to more adult themes or contemporary themes? Now this is all speculation of course, but remember this is helmed by Disney. So we can't put any mind control slash grooming allegations to the side here. I think of this almost like the most popular Netflix shows of the day. It seems that in most of these shows during the first season or two, they get you really invested in the characters but then they pull a bait and switch on you, where now your favorite character is gay. So it's meant to have you question your own sensibilities and your feelings about that type of lifestyle.
Overall, I really didn't have a problem with this type of mature content, but kids might. And also kids might be bored with the slow pacing as well. Now one thing I did have a problem with is the parallel track of the flashbacks alongside the main story thread. We've seen this type of storytelling over and over again in many shows today, where the current trajectory of the hero's story unfolds alongside flashbacks of similar events happening in the character's life in the past. In this show, we see Cassian blasting off into space alongside Luthen in the main story thread, and then we see a flashback of him blasting off into space alongside Marva as a kid. And there are many other instances of this too, such as him sneaking around in ships. But anyways, this trope is just getting a bit old for me. For me. So let's get into the key elements from this show and some notes and comments that I have. Now a new element that we're getting introduced to here in the years leading up to A New Hope is the element of the Empire being spread so far across the galaxy that they don't have the resources to have boots on the ground in all the systems that they occupy. In this series you see these sentry guards, basically private security guards, running the day-to-day -day police business of the Empire. And this private security force is a department of large corporations that the Empire oversees. So the idea is that if there are no problems, then the Empire won't bring the hammer down. Which is why the older superior officer in Episode 1, when told of the murder of the two cops at the hands of Andor, tells his subordinate to cover it up. Here's a clip. Tough case. Bad timing. This case appears to bear all the hallmarks of what I like to describe as regrettable misadventure. They clearly harassed a human with dark features and chose the wrong person to annoy. I suspect they died rushing to aid someone in distress. Nothing too heroic, we don't need a parade. They died being helpful. Something sad but inspiring in a mundane sort of way. You look stricken, Deputy Inspector. Are you absorbing my meaning here? Trying, sir. I am on my way this very morning to an Imperial Regional Command review where I'll be asked to make a report about our crime rates. And the goal of that speech, should you ever be asked to deliver it, is brevity. Minimizing the time the Empire spends thinking about Preox Morlana benefits our superiors and, by extension, everyone here at the Primor Security Inspection Team, which at the moment includes you. Now, as these episodes unfold, you see that the subordinate, Cyril, does not follow the chain of command to lie. Instead, he launches a full-scale operation into the deaths. The irony here is that the chief wanted to avoid, as Obi-Wan would say, imperial entanglements by lying and covering things up. But as Cyril did the noble thing, this will in fact lead to imperial involvement, since his mission was an abject failure. 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 Now, here's a few more clips about this corporate private security group which is called the Corporate Tactical Forces, and about the approaches they're gonna take to find out who the murderer is and bring him in. And also they talk a little bit about rumors of potential uprisings that they're hearing about. It's a plague on discipline. Face your men, yourself, the rest of your life, knowing you did less than everything you possibly could. I've been saying all along we need a stronger hand with these affiliated planets. There's fermenting out there, son. Pockets of fermenting. Corporate tactical forces are the Empire's first line of defense, and the best way to keep the blade sharp is to use it. Now my favorite bit of symbolism regarding these corporate goons is the shape of their space transport. Now when they landed on Ferex to search for Cassian, they arrived in the old clone transport vehicles from the Clone Wars. So basically the Empire was giving them their old hand-me-downs, while the Empire created their new Imperial vehicles like Star Destroyers and TIE Fighters. But the funny thing is, these clone transports were actually being held inside another carrier vehicle in deep space. Think of an aircraft carrier in the ocean. And when you see that vehicle, it was in the shape of a flying pyramid. 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 Of course. Hey, Lucasfilm, Stargate wants its ships back. 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 Something else interesting the show brought in was the aspect of the droids and their power supplies. Specifically around how their power supply was affected by having to lie to other characters. Several times in these episodes, both Marva and Cassian tell their droids to either lie or hold back from telling things to people. Here's a clip. Listen to me, it's important. I know it takes a lot of energy, but can you make a lie for me? I can lie. I have adequate power reserves. Don't tell anybody you saw me. Don't tell anybody you know where I am. Yes, 
wants two lives. It's a wolf. Then we'll have to recharge at home. Now this concept is true with humans as well. Telling lies and spreading false information is like a web. And it can cause more pain and distress than by just being truthful. So yeah, lies do drain our life force. And it also drains you from what God intended you to be. Now let's talk about that planet that Cassian came from, Kanari. We see through flashbacks that him and his sister and other children are living in a forest among the trees. We don't see any parents in these scenes, so it appears to be a Lord of the Flies type situation, or even Children of the Corn. In episode two, we get a brief description of this planet. Here's a clip. Kanari, mid rim, abandoned after Imperial mining disaster. Mining, everyone died. Abandoned and considered toxic, Imperial Prohibition. So it's possible all the parents died in this accident, but I'm still confused about the timeline. As Cassian was a kid growing up in the prequel era, where the Republic was in charge, not the Empire. You even hear Marva mention the Republic is on its way to the crashed ship that they find. So maybe more to come on this story. Not only do we hear about the disaster that occurred, but we also see that the crashed ship was containing some sort of biological weapon that had apparently killed all aboard, causing it to crash. Also notice that the flight suits had Separatist Alliance insignias. Of course, remember back to when Separatist scientist Nuvo Vindi tried to bring back the Blue Shadow Virus in the Clone Wars series. So this is all very interesting, but we don't have any more contacts. 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 A bit of symbolism I thought was fitting was the face paint that the Canari children were putting on before they approached the crashed ship. Now many of these children put a single stripe down the middle of their mouth and chin. Looking into this a little bit, I found out that the Native American war paint symbolized this type of marking as fit for a, quote, new warrior, unquote. So this is very fitting because they likely had not seen foreign ships or foreigners up to this point. They were untested, but ready, warriors. warriors. So a few other things to talk about. Now, at the beginning of the series, before Cassian goes into the brothel, a bouncer stops him and tells him four things that are not allowed in the club. Here's a clip. Right there. No weapons, no comms, no credit, no nonsense. Now, what fascinates me about this list of banned slash disallowed items is that it sounds an awful lot like a checklist that the NWO would implement in their smart cities in the future. No guns for obvious reasons. We don't really have to retread on the gun control elements. No comms. They don't want us to be able to communicate with the outside world. Just think of China that locked down their communications and internet systems so information doesn't leak out. No credit. Almost a nod to the social credit system and how if you have no credit, you can't participate in society. And finally, no nonsense. You know, none of that crazy critical thinking would be allowed. Allowed. Now let's talk about some of the quotes spoken by the character of Luthen. These quotes are very much an inverse of what we just discussed, where those were the rules that the government wants us to live by, whereas these are the rules that the outsiders, that the rebels, want us to live by. In the third episode, Luthen tells Cassian about two rules that he adheres to in order to live outside of government control. Here's another clip. Are you carrying a calm leg? Why? Give it. Give it to me now. Give it. Rule number one, never carry anything you don't control. What is that? I put slap charges on the doors. What? When? Rule number two, build your exit on your way in. Brace yourself. Now this first rule, never carry anything you don't control, basically means that anything you have at your disposal to use, you and only you should have 100% access to it. Now, we all fail this in our world when it comes to our phones. Phones send and receive so much information that we often don't even realize. True, we can use it to communicate with friends, set up meetings, and so many other good things, but at the end of the day, you really don't 100% control it. The same goes with housing, land, cars, etc. Most of us don't 100% own or control these things either. Someone or some other entity still has a vested interest in it. 
second rule is easier for us to adhere to, or at least to try to adhere to. Planning your exit, or at least having a plan B to get yourself out of danger if you need to. In this clip, Luthen had placed explosives at the entrance to their secret rendezvous point, knowing that he may need to blast his way back out, which they did need to do, so he planned ahead. Planning ahead can mean different things for different people. Now this can mean planning financially for your family's future, or it can mean planning to live off the grid away from society. It can involve investing in gold, silver, crypto as a means to avoid a potential collapse of the dollar or world economies. It can also involve doing your own farming as a way to mitigate supply chain issues or to break free of the poisons that all these large corporations have been feeding us over the years. Now, whatever the case may be for you, that's specifically up to you. But these are all things to keep in mind as a way to stay ahead of the game in a proactive versus reactive manner. Now for the last section of this podcast. I wanted to bring up a biblical parallel to Cassian that was suggested to me recently. So big shout out to Maverick Pilgrim on Instagram, who is also part of the Fire Theft Radio podcast, who I've done a podcast with previously. Now he mentioned that Cassian could be interpreted as a Moses-like figure, specifically in terms of his actions at the beginning of the series. So Moses, according to the biblical account in Exodus, had seen the oppression of the Israelites by the Egyptians, and he had murdered an Egyptian that was involved. After this, he fled to the land of Midian, where he hid for many years. He was then called by God to go back and lead the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt and bring them to the Promised Land, the land they were meant to inhabit. However, Moses never got to truly step foot in the Promised Land. Per God in the book of Deuteronomy, this was due to specific occasions when he sinned and didn't follow God's instructions. And after leading the people for 40 years in the wilderness, Moses finally saw from a mountaintop the land that was promised to them. But he never got to step foot, because he died. If you think about the Cassie and Andor story, you see a similar trajectory here. In the beginning of the show, we see him murder two people, and then he flees. And then in episode 3 of the show, we see the character Luthen appear to Cassian and invite him to join a greater cause, the Rebel Alliance. Now we know for the next five years that he spends his time working with the Alliance on trying to free the people of the galaxy from the Empire's slavery. However, like Moses, he does not see the cause come to fruition. In Rogue One, we see him physically witness the transmission of the Death Star plans to the rebel ships out in space, but then he's subsequently killed by a blast from the Death Star. Now, Cassian mentions in Rogue One that he had done many terrible things on behalf of the Rebellion. So similar to Moses, you can infer that he committed so many sins and that impacted his ability to truly see the payoff of the rebel victory. Anyways, this was a very interesting parallel, so big shout out again to Maverick. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Conspiracy in the Force. I'll be back with you soon to discuss episode 4 of the series. I'll also be back with a very fun episode discussing the Woke Bingo card, which I found on Twitter recently. And we'll break down how woke or not woke the various Star Wars series and movies have been under the Disney umbrella. This is Conspiracy Kyle, signing off. May the Force be with you, and God bless.